Okay, folks, I'm going to make a start. Um, for those of, the, those of you who don't know the general history, um, after the First World War, David Lloyd George made a speech in, wit in which he promised to build a land fit for heroes to live in, or words to that effect. He also, in the speech, used the term homes for heroes. As a result of that, the Houses of Parliament in London in 1919 passed an act called the Irish Land, open brackets, provision for sailors and soldiers, close bracket, act. And this act provided money, financial, financial support for the um, uh, building of houses for men who had come home from the First World War. It didn't matter whether they were sailors, soldiers, airmen, or merchant navy or mercantile marine, as it was called then. So long as they had served their country, um, they were entitled to apply for a house. Uh, between 1921 and 1939, 1,252 houses were built across Northern Ireland. Probably about double that were built in the Irish Free State. Um, I'm not covering any of them today because there's too many of them. Um, so houses were built across Northern Ireland. There were Belfast was obviously a centre point for um, the building of houses, but in this particular area. Newton Abbey, um, you've got houses at Cambrai Park down below the railway tracks, you've got the ones here at Ypres Park and you've got the ones up at Glen Gormley which were called um, St Quintin's Park. The British Legion also built four houses in um, White House at the bottom or near the bottom of Doak Road near where it comes to where the, it's, I think there's a school near there now? Okay, yeah. So um, they built four there. They also built four in Dunmurray and four in Dungannon. But that was the extent of the British Legion um, building of properties after the First World War. So the first handout is this, which shows what the um, area looked like before and after the construction of the houses. So if you want to pass that round. Um, 36 houses were built here on a 9.6 acre parcel of land. It had been purchased from James McCann of Meadowvale on Alliance Avenue. And at that stage, he was the owner of Ferner House. So the land that this was built on was part of the Ferner House estate. The land was bought for 1,600 pounds, which in current terms is 80,000 pounds. So when you consider nearly 10 acres, um, 80,000, you would not get anywhere near that in, in modern terms. If you were buying 10 acres now, you'd be talking about half a million. That's because a lot of the people who sold the land that these houses were built on were doing it as part of giving back to the men for their service. So there's an element that they, that they were selling the land below the market value. Um, the building work here commenced in July 1923 and was com completed by March 1925. That means that most of the people that moved in here moved in round about, some would have moved in in 1924, but most would have moved in in 1925. There's three, well, two styles of house within this community. Sometimes I use the word colony um, because it was almost self-contained. And these are from the ISSLT plans and they show what the houses looked like. So there are four semi-detached houses two at this end of Ypres Park and two at the very far end. 35 was one of the semi-detached ones. Um, and there's also eight four house terraces. Um, in the four house terrace, uh, the inner ones were classed as um, type Z2 and the outer ones were classed as type Z1. But in, in essence, whether it was a semi-detached or one of the four block, each of the houses had the same basic facilities, amenities and layout. Um, each had a scullery kitchen, living room, bathroom and water closet, toilet on the ground floor and three bedrooms on the upper floor. So for most of the men who were allocated houses here, it was probably the first time they'd lived in a house which had more than two bedrooms. And it was probably the first time they'd lived in a house which had running water where you didn't have to go to a tap in the street. Um, the houses are all roughly the same size, 804 square feet for the 
the semi-detached and for the outer, sorry, the, the inner ones of the Type 4 and 789 square feet for the outer ones of the Type 4. So your family would have lived in one of the Type 4 houses. They were an inner house, I think. Um, so that would have been a Type Z2. Doesn't mean an awful lot, but... Um, on average, each house sat on a 0.27 um, acre parcel of land. So just over a quarter of an acre, which when you compare that to houses where these men would have lived in before the war, where they would maybe have had a backyard, which was, you know, 20 feet long, if that. The rent was 25 pounds per week. Sorry, the rent was <laughs> 10 shillings per week. In current terms, that's £25 per week. Now, when you look at that house, semi-detached, if you were wanting to rent a semi-detached house with three bedrooms, even if that hasn't been extended to the rear, if you're wanting to rent a house of that size with those facilities today, you would be paying a heck of a lot more than £25. And that's because the £25 was, in essence, not a rent, but it was a... <coughs> pardon me, a contribution towards the maintenance of the houses. So every two years or so, um, the ISSLT tendered for um, companies to bid to go around the various estates or colonies and paint the houses. Originally, all the houses were painted white um, because it was, it was more cost effective to have them all painted white. So whenever a company was tendering to, to repaint, they knew what the score was. They knew they had to buy 355 gallons of white paint or white wash or whatever. <coughs> the rents did fluctuate up and down in the 1930s and 1940s. It actually went down in the early 1930s and it didn't start to go back to go up again until the 1940s. Um, the pier points have, on the Brennans between them, have the deeds and the various, uh, what's the word, documentation which showed the rent for the, for the property over at different times. So we're gonna start off, I'm gonna be visiting one, I'm gonna be talking about one um, occupant for each of the blocks of houses. So two semi-detached, eight um, four house terraces. So we're gonna be, I'm gonna be talking about 10 men who lived in these houses. And the first one is the one immediately across the road. <laughs> I do also have some historic photographs of the houses before any modifications were done. So you get to see them in their original state. <clears throat> Be aware of traffic. Um, this is the semi-detached house which is behind us. This photograph would have been taken in 1925, shortly after the houses were completed. And you can see the next house in the block, and you can just see the start of the curve. And the trees. And the trees, yeah. <laughs> so the guy that lived here was Charles James George Morgan Haithwaite. And he was born on eight, in, um, January 1877 at Brookfield Place in Belfast to James Haithwaite, who was a bleacher and Charlotte Rooston. He was a bookkeeper when he enlisted with the Imperial Yeomanry in January 1900. Served in the Second Boer War with the 175th Irish Horse Company and then with the 60th North Irish Horse Company. He was awarded the Queen's South African Medal with Cape Colony, Orange Free State, Transvaal and Rhodesia Clasps and the King's South African Medal with the South Africa 1901 and the South Africa 1902 Clasps. So even before the First World War started, this guy already had already done military service in a war scenario. In, in 1912, he was appointed as a way leave officer with the post office in England. I had to look up what a way leave officer is. Anyone want to guess? Nope. Okay. Basically, it was a man who would have, pardon me, would have negotiated on behalf of the post office to, um, to have access to properties. Um, so access agreement with local landowners and so forth if the post office was building a new um, post office, obviously. 
He enlisted with the Royal Irish Rifles and deployed to France in October 1915 and held the rank of sergeant when he was reported as wounded in the War Office casualty list dated 25th September 1916. He was then transferred to the Labour Corps and then to the Class Z Army Reserve on 3rd March um, 1919 and returned to his post office position in England. Class Z Army Reserve was for men who had joined up for the period of the war, so they weren't regular soldiers. And it meant that if the peace negotiations had collapsed, they were liable for immediate recall to military service. Um, at various stages, I'll try and explain some of the more unusual military terms. Some people will know them, like Gary, and hopefully Peter, by the number of tours of mine he's been on, but you can't guarantee it with Peter. Martin will also probably recognise a few of them. Charles married uh, Margaret Jane Hackett on 1st February 1924 at Knockbury to Parish Church. In the street directories, his post-war occupation is recorded as Inspector Civil Service, but it doesn't say what type of inspector or what department. So he could have been an inspector for, for example, uh, the Ministry of um, Agriculture, going around inspecting farms, or he could have been an inspector for, um, in building terms, so he would have gone and uh, examined buildings that were being erected to make sure they followed any procedures or um, requirements at the time. He was then later employed in the rate fixing department at Short and Harland. Now, it seems a bit of a strange name for a department, the rate fixing, because rate fixing you tend to associate it with a negative aspect in that, you know, they're, they're um, fiddling things. But that's who he worked with, with Short, uh, Short and Harland. He was a member of the Andrew Henderson Masonic Lodge 512 and of the British, of the White Abbey branch of the British Legion. Most of the men who lived here and in Cambrai Park would have been members of the local British Legion. The, local, the British Legion Hall, which is a war memorial hall, was built in the mid-1920s, and I think it was primarily built there because of the proximity to the ex-servicemen's houses. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, he died on 14th January 1942, aged 65, and he left 90, 96 pounds, five shillings and one penny in his will, which went to his widow. That's approximately 3,732 pounds in current terms. Uh, Margaret died at Beaconsfield Nursing Home on 26th, 28th March 1967, aged 82. But I'm not sure where she was living before she went into the nursing home. She could well have still been living in the property here. Uh, Charles and Margaret um, Haythwaite are buried in Carnmoney Main Cemetery, but unfortunately there's no memorial or headstone at their grave. So we're going to go down, going to go down this way, keeping to this side, go around the, the way green and then across the road and come back up. So it'll be a, a wee bit of a circuit. I, I, I do remember that there was a ruling uh, that once if the, the husband died, the, the, the widow could stay on. Well, no, that, that came after. A certain year, but I can't remember which year. Right. Well, I do know that. Oh no, the widow could stay on, but no family. But the, the widow yes, died, the family had to go yes, that's a, that's then exactly it. Then the family were able to buy the house. That yes, that was in that was from about so 1952. On, but if she had died with her husband, the yeah. Family would have had well, I know that one instance in um, Ainsworth Avenue where the wife pre pre deceased the veteran, yeah. so she died in something like 1928. He died in 1932, leaving five children under the age of 20, oh, no. and they were evicted. Oh, no. I remember Granny, I don't always listen to what Granny said, but I do remember that. I, do, I know that there's some where um, the man never appears in the street directories because he moved in in, say, 1931, uh -huh. died in 1931, yeah. and his widow's recorded as the occupant in 1932. Right, we're just going to stop here. <laughs> That woman, Gwenny Moore's husband. I lived in here. I remember the big boat there. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that big boat. I remember the big boat. Okay, folks, um, setting aside Noah and his big boat. <laughs> number 12, Ypres Park. Oh, look. Let's look at the door. Here. <coughs> <coughs> 
Hello. Have you got five pounds? Uh, <laughs> oh, oh. Get out of there. Okay, I'm going to carry on as I do. I'm going to pass this round. This is one of the occupants of this house behind us. So, Taplin indeed. So, um, Maria's mum. They're related to Bobby Lockham. Yes, Bobby Lockham. Yes, Bobby. That's Bobby's mum. <laughs> <laughs> this is what's called the community tour. You get all the community gossip. Okay, John Robinson was the first man to live in this house. And he was a member of the Belfast Harbour Police. And he was the occupant in 1926 and 1927 street directories. The next occupant was W. McCartney, who was a tenter. And he was recorded as the occupant in the 1928 directory. Now, with the directories, you've got to realize that the 1928 directory, the information for it would have been gathered in 1927. So it really indicates who was living there in 1927. As I was just saying to one of the other ladies, I've come across some where the occupant is recorded as Mrs. Johnson, for example, but there's no record of a Mr. Johnson being there. And that's because the, the house was allocated to him, but he died in the same year that he moved into the house. So by the time the next um, set of uh, collation of information for the street directories occurred, his widow was living there because the houses were never allocated to women. If, as, um, sorry, what's your name? Mima. As Mima um, said when we were walking down, um, if the veteran died, his widow had the right to remain in the property. But when she died, and if the family had not bought the house, the, family, the other members of the family were not allowed to remain in the house. One example of that I know of for Mainsworth Avenue, where the wife died in 1928. The Great War veteran died in 1932, living, leaving five children under the age of 20, and the trust took measures to evict them. Now, you could say, well, that's very cruel of them. They did eventually give them some like six months to find alternative accommodation. But at the end of the day, they were saying these houses were built for veterans. They were not built for the families of veterans. So there and at that stage, there would have been people queuing up waiting to get these houses. In fact, right up into the 1960s, there was still a waiting list in, in Belfast for men who were were on a waiting list to be allocated one of these houses. So basically they were waiting for people to die off. Um, from 1952, the occupant, whether it was the, uh, the Great War veteran or his widow, had the right to buy the properties. And then once that happened, um, there was no, no other ex-veterans would be allocated those properties because they were then privately owned. For the waiting list, was there a prioritization to get the house? There was, was based on injuries or anything? yes, there was the process for being allocated a house. You had to fill out an application form, and in the application form, you had to specify your service both at home and overseas. You had to specify whether you had been injured or gassed, or whether you had contracted an illness on active service. A lot of men contracted TB, um, and a lot of men obviously. Um, contracted things like bronchitis and suffered with respiratory illnesses for the rest of their lives, whether due to the weather conditions or due to the gassing or a combination of the two. Um, they also had to specify whether they'd received any gallantry awards. So a man who was awarded a military medal would get a certain number of points. A man who was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal would get another couple of points. Um, there was also the element of um, the size of the family. So a married man with one child would get less points than a married man with five children. Um, also, they took into account the current living conditions. So if you've got a man who's getting a, um, a, an army pension for bronchitis and they examine his current living conditions and as a husband and wife and three children living in a one room apartment where there is a damp problem, he would get more points for that. And all the points would be totaled up and then they would say, right, um, and they would allocate on the basis of points. So it's a, it's a, it was a bit like they, they do sometimes with social security benefits. Um, so men would be prioritized according to the number of points that they were, they were gaining. Um, it also depend on whether they were getting an army pension or a navy pension, because obviously they, the ISSLT, the trust, 
we're more, in, we're more inclined to give properties to men who are getting a pension because if they could not get work, they would still be able to pay the rent out of their pension. Is that okay? Um, <laughs> the following year, the occupant was recorded as Jane Bunting, but the, the longest living family in this house were the Tapling or Taplin family. Um, William Vance Taplin was born on 6th May 1892, and that was a photograph of him that I passed round and of his grave. It's, it's quite a fantastic, but it's not, it doesn't print out very well, but it, it shows him post-war, probably in the 1920s. The medals he's wearing, that's his military medal. The next one is his star. The next one is his British War Medal and the Victory Medal. Now, the star medals were issued generally around about 1920, 1921. The British War Medal and the Victory Medal tended to be issued 1922, 1923. So the fact that he's got the star medal and, and the Victory Medal and War Medal means that we can more or less date that photograph to around about 1922, 1923, which is brilliant to be able to do. What rank was he? He was a sergeant. sergeant. So he was born at Campbell's Row in Dublin to William Robert Taplin, who was a postman, and Elizabeth Sweeney. In 1911, the family was living at Rutland Place, north in the Mountjoy district of Dublin, and William Jr. was working as a messenger. He enlisted with the Royal Irish Rifles and was posted 1st Battalion on the Western Front on 6th November 1914. That implies to me that he enlisted before the war. So he maybe enlisted in 1912 or 1913. So he was already in the army when the war started and he would have been um, stationed, I think, in Aden. They were brought back and then sent out to the Western Front in November. He was living at Charleville Avenue in Dublin when he married Julia Kelly of Aylesbury Road. On 15th February 1918 at the Roman Catholic Chapel in Church in Donnybrook, although he had been brought up as Church of Ireland. So in all the census records, he's recorded as being Church of Ireland, but he married in a Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Corporal William Taplin, as he then was, was wounded twice in 1918, serving with 2nd Battalion, and those who were reported in the War Office casualty list stated 28th September 1918, and 10th December 1918. So basically he was wounded probably, by the time they get around to reporting them, his first wounding would have been possibly in July 1918. Um, William was stationed at Victoria Barracks in Belfast when a son, William Robert Taplin, was born in January 1920. He continued his army service with the Royal Ulster Rifles and was discharged in 1932. Um, in 1942, William and Julia Taplin were living at 12 Ypres Park when they were informed that their son, Abel Seaman William Robert Taplin, was missing, presumed killed. The Admiralty sub subsequently confirmed that Abel Seaman Taplin had died when HMS Jaguar was torpedoed and sunk by German submarine U-652 off the coast of Egypt on 26 March 1942. He was 22 years old and is commemorated on the Plymouth Memorial Naval Memorial. A second son, Henry Francis Taplin, was killed in action on 7th June 1944, so during the Normandy landings, aged 19 while serving with 7th Battalion Parachute Regiment, and he's buried in the Ranville War Cemetery in France. The two sons who died are commemorated on small um, commemorative plaques which, are, which were placed in the green. So again, if you want to pass that round, um, this there's a, a sort of a small garden of remembrance within the community here. At some stage, there were plans, and I can't remember when it was, that the trust or the Milliburn Trust wanted to build on there. Can you remember? Well, that's about four in the late 70s. Late 70s, I wasn't sure. So late 70s, early 80s, possibly, the trust had this small area of land and they thought, right, we can probably build three houses on there. But the local residents wanted to retain that as a community area and so they petitioned the local council and the local council backed them and eventually the council then established that as a garden of remembrance so in the various trees that are in that in that semicircle there are black markers at each of the trees and they commemorate men who were sons of occupants who died in the second world war and i think there's also one for an iuc man from the 1970s yep <laughs>
that's a vehicle. Oh, yeah, that was my... That was Curry. Yep. The fella Curry. It was... Yep. I'm going to speak about him in a few minutes. This is another fantastic old photograph which shows the D or the um, the green area. So again, if you want to pass that round, so it would have been taken from roughly um, that many and go forward about 100 yards. That's where that photograph would have been taken from. So we're going to walk on round and round the corner. These houses here are inbuilds that are built inside the um, the gardens of original houses. <clears throat> yeah, these one, these three here are Simpsons Villas. I think it would probably be Simpsons Villas, Ypres Park, Linfield. And Leeds, yeah. Yeah, but we don't want to talk about Leeds. Uh. <laughs> I'm very good here. Good for Well, I've only done two. <laughs> When you look down here, you can see the size of the gardens. The gardens went right the way back. So you can see where the, what I call the Weetabix houses. Um, huh? I love the Weetabix house. <laughs> I call them Weetabix because they look like stacked Weetabixes. Um, so basically the gardens ran back to the, where you see those large trees. They were massive. And a lot of the people um, who lived here ran market gardens. Um, for example, the Brennans, um, he was a fruit and veg merchant. And, bread, and he, maybe? huh? And bread as well. No, he didn't do bread, no. <laughs> no, he didn't. He so Yes. Um, so they would have gone um, out, he would have gone out with his horse and cart, selling in the White Abbey, selling his own produce in the White Abbey area. Um, is that, am I, am I more or less right? <laughs> I'm always heart scared that um, somebody will correct me. Yep, that's the Pierpoint's house. Yeah. Well, um, that's that's um, Mr. Pierpoint and his sister, or sister-in-law maybe. Oop. No one there yet. Yep. <sighs> okay, so this is the. Wait for the others to catch up. Yeah. I'm just going to wait here. If you want to say anything at the end of my spiel, okay. just from a you know personal no perspective. Problem. It's very strange. It's normally Gary's bringing up the rear, but not today. Okay. Um, number eighteen, Ypres Park, and between infam or photograph that was provided by Raymond. Raymond and the photograph I found of his merchant navy card. We've got a photograph of, of this man when he was young and when he was not so young. So again, if you want to pass that round. Um, the first occupant here, <laughs> the first occupant here was Harper Crawford Porter, who was a postman and he was recorded as the occupant in the street directories from 1926 to 1928. So he would have moved in round about 1925. Um, but he was recorded as the occupant of 15 Cambrai Park in the 1929 street directory. So basically he moved from here across the railway tracks to one of the ISSLT properties on the other side. Why he moved, we don't know. I don't know um, because the facilities for the houses here were better, larger and better than the facilities for the houses on the other in Cambrai Park. Um, but it could just be that he had a smaller family and he felt he didn't need the extra room. The next occupant was William Walmsley and he was taken to court by the ISSLT in 1933 for being in arrears of his rent. By 1940, the occupants were Alexander and Agnes Corrie and they were the, the longest um, longest serving residents, if I can use that term. So Alexander Corrie, <coughs> and sometimes the, the surname is represented as Corrie, um, was born on 16th April 1891 at Silver Grove Street, and his parents were Thomas John Corrie, a carpenter, and Rachel Lindsay, although the surname was recorded, as I said, as Corrie in the Register of Births. The family was living at Carmel, Carmel Street in 1911, 
So that's over in the Holy Land district of Belfast, I think, when Alexander was a linen lapper. He enlisted with the North Irish Horse on 22nd May 1915 and was posted to the Western Front sometime after December of that year. He later served with the Corps of Hussars and transferred to the Class Z Army Reserve on 2nd March 1919. Now, bearing in mind the armistice was signed on the 11th of November 1918, but it's a misconception that once the that once the armistice was signed, everyone went home. Men had to stay on the Western Front um, because it was just an armistice. It wasn't, and it was only originally for 30 days, and then it was extended for another 30 days, and then in January 1919, it was extended indefinitely. And it was at that point in January 1919 that the army decided, right, we can start sending some of the men home and the men who were being sent home first would have been men who had enlisted for the period of the war. Men who had been already in the army before the war would have, would have um, more likely have um, uh, stayed on the Western Front. And then after the signing of the peace treaty, the British and the French and the Belgians occupied the Rhineland. So a lot of men stayed, opted to stay on for an additional year as part of what was called the Army of Occupation. So not everyone were, were sent home immediately. He's commemorated on the Roll of Honour for Eakinhead Presbyterian Church, which at that time was at the top of Frederick Street in Belfast, so at the junction of Frederick Street and North Queen Street. And um, that's where uh, uh, that church was located. They then later in the 1930s, they moved out along the Antrim Road to North Circular Road, um, where they retained the name Eakinhead and then they merged with Rosemary Street Presbyterian Church after it was destroyed in the German air raids of 1941. See, you don't just get ex-servicemen history, you get Presbyterian Church history. And we, you say there, he's recorded in their... Roll of Honour. So if you go, well... Um, Can I see that now? Uh, the, it's a Roll of Honour book. But the Presbyterian Church was the only denomination in the world, and I say that with pride as a Presbyterian, <laughs> um, that produced, in the 1920s, they produced a book which covered the whole of Ireland and recorded the names of everyone from each congregation that were put forward for inclusion. Some congregations didn't put any names forward, like Carrie Duff, but others put forward hundreds of names. Rosemary Street had something like 500 plus names on its roll of honour. I can't remember off the top of my head what Eakin had was, but it was probably around about 100, 150. So that book, um, Rule of Honour book can be viewed in either the Linen Hall Library and it's also, I think, in Central Library in Belfast. I've got images of each page, so if you want, I can send you the page for Eakinhead. Their memorial tablet for the men who fell from the congregation is in what's now called the Eakinhead Memorial Halls on North Circular Road, but it's just for the fatalities. Um, they were living at Pym Street when a son, Thomas Stewart, died on 24th January 1927, aged five months. Robert Corrie um, was a member of the White Abbey Special Constabulary, that was, so this was his son, and he died on 20th September 1943, aged 19. Were there any special circumstances in that, do you know? Um, he had tuberculosis, and I know, as was Trevor Brennan actually told me, that right. in, in those days, because he had tuberculosis, they put him out of the house, and he lived in a garden, he spent his last couple of months in a garden shed at the back of the garden. <laughs> well, they did say, I mean, when you consider the White Abbey Sanatorium was less than half a mile away, um, but yes, there was the perception, rightly or wrongly, that fresh air was good for people with tuberculosis. Um, so I just wasn't sure with him being in the special constabulary whether it was a, an active service type thing. Okay, um, Alexander Corey was a member of the White Abbey Branch British Legion and he was also a member of the Union of Shop, Distribu Distributive and Allied Workers. He died suddenly at hospital on 3rd November 1954, aged 63, and is buried in Carnmoney Main Cemetery. In October 1969, a daughter, Rachel Corey, was knocked down by a car at Port Mock Island McGee and subsequently suffered from, from thrombosis and breathlessness. She was found dead at 18 Ypres Park on 26th August 1970, aged 42. Um, and she also is buried in Carnmoney Cemetery. 
Another son, Detective Constable Stanley Corey, and the black plaque for him is just behind us at that tree with the daffodils. He was killed in the execution of his duties at the Avoca shopping centre on the Andersonstown Road on 1st November 1971, and he was 28 years of age. Agnes Corey was treasurer of the Ferna Senior Citizens Club and a member of the William Stewart Memorial Women's Loyal Orange Lodge No. 150 when she died at April Park on 12th February 1981, aged 79. And she's buried in Carmony East Cemetery. So uh, Alexander, Robert and Rachel. Rachel, thank you, are buried in Carmony Main Cemetery and their mother's buried across the road in the, um, in the East Cemetery. Obviously, they didn't get along very well. <laughs> but I, I, I assume that the, the, uh, the plot in the, in the main cemetery was full by that stage. Yeah. And so a new plot was born, was bought, bought across the, the road. OK, the next one is the house immediately behind us. I mean, it's not a great photograph of, of him in his garden. And most of the guys that lived here were keen gardeners. The gardens were big to enable them to grow fruit and veg for their own purposes, but also possibly to sell. So you might have somebody that grew strawberries and then somebody else grew raspberries and they would have swapped their produce around. But there were also people like the Brennans who were more professional fruiterers and grocers and they would have um, grown food on a, a semi-commercial basis. And apparently there were pigs and chickens as well. Yep. Yeah. Oh, pigs, chickens. Goodness knows what they had. Um, but as I was saying earlier, according to the, uh, the deeds, they were not allowed to keep livestock. I think we saw that in the ones you have. Um, so they weren't allowed to keep livestock, but basically a, a blind eye was turned to that. Um, another great historic photograph is of the house behind us and the corner of this house, which shows the gardens and the, the trees when they were very young trees and that is also a photograph of the next man who lived in number 22 and that was the um, was Thomas Hagen Brennan. The first occupant of that of 22 April Park was David Stevenson who was a labourer and he was recorded as the occupant in the directories for 1926 and 1927 and then in 1928 the occupant in the street directory was recorded as Thomas Brennan a fruiterer which is very difficult to say. But basically he was a fruit and veg merchant. Would that be right? Yep. Uh, so Thomas Hagen Brennan was born on 10th June 1892 at White Row in Carrickfergus to Samuel Brennan and Margaret Hagen and the family lived at Crampton Court in Carrick in 1901. Thomas was working as a farm labourer and living with his widowed mother and five siblings at Courtry Street in Belfast in 1911. One of his brothers, James, was already serving as a soldier with the Royal Engineers. Thomas um, married Mary Brennan from Jordanstown on 24th December 1913 at Donegal Street Congregational Church. Mary died of pulmonary tuberculosis at Taylor's Row on 1st November 1914, aged 20 years and nine months. And at that stage, Thomas was recorded as being a gardener. That doesn't mean he just potted around in his garden. It means that he did gardening for a living for other people, quite possibly in some of the larger houses in Carrick or wherever. And unfortunately, when you see these in the census, it doesn't say, it doesn't say things like gardener to um, Edenmore House or gardener to something else. It just says gardener and it, it, it leaves you wondering, well, what type of gardener was he professional? Was he, um, did he uh, work for a number of different people or whatever? Right. Was that before the war, after the war? After the war, yeah. Right. Um, so back to where I was. He enlisted as a driver with the Royal Field Artillery and was posted to 8th Divisional Ammunition Column in France on 7th April 1915. During a 10-day period of home leave, Thomas married Mary Neal on 24th September 1917 at White Abbey Presbyterian Church. Transferred to the Army Reserve on 24th February 1919 and remained in the Army Reserve until discharged on 10th November 1926. His post discharge address was Edenmore Lodge, Jordanstown. That was the lodge for Edenmore House, which later became a veter veterinary college 
and then later still became Edenmore Hotel. Thomas and Mary were living at Jordanstown when Thomas Neil Brennan and Agnes Neil Brennan were born in January 1920 and January 1921 respectively. He was recorded as being still as a gardener in the register of births for both of his children, both of those children. In 1927, Thomas Brennan of 22 April Park advertised his services as a gardener in Belfast newspapers. And as I said, he also um, produced, uh, sold produce from his own garden from a horse and cart. Um, as a wee aside, he also planted the tree, a tree that was at the front of White Abbey Hospital. I think that, that information came from you. Yeah. Um, 1963, Mary Brennan, Mrs. Mary Brennan of 22 April Park, won £50 from Mr. Presents at the Ideal Home Exhibition. Um, basically, this was a guy that employed by the Belfast Telegraph, I think, and he went around handing out, handing out money. <laughs> Wouldn't get away with that these days. Um, when she was interviewed, she said that she planned to use the money to visit her married daughter in Canada and then something about world peace. <laughs> no, that was just a wee add-on. Thomas Brennan died on 22nd October 1975 and Mary was living at 22 April Park when she died at hospital on 16th January 1982. Thomas and Mary Brennan are, are buried in Victoria Cemetery in Carrickfergus. 22 April Park remains in the family being the home of Elizabeth Pierpoint, who was a granddaughter of Thomas Hagen, and Mr. Pierpoint, I've forgotten your name, Graham. Um, and whenever I visited their house, they brought out all these documents that showed um, his uh, agreements in 1932 and then 1936 or something, right the way up into, I think it was the late 1940s. And it would enable me to, to see how the rents changed over those periods. So we're going to head on further around um, to the other, the last of the four block houses. <laughs> this is coming up to the ones where yeah, your family lived. I lived in 34. Mrs. Sharp was in this end. We right. Don't marry, they owned all the pubs, they owned the uh -huh. car and all. Well, that was the, the Sharp's house. That was the Peden's. I don't know Mrs. Peden's name, but I know the father. The old father was called Dickie Peden. Yeah, Richard Peden. Because... Matt always lived there all his days, and I should say, Mum, why did Matt never marry? He said, Mark, was a lovely man, but Dickie kids have an awful life. Right. So that's why well, Matt was there all his days. Yeah, it's, very, it's very easy for us now to look back and say, oh, would, would, but you don't know what he had gone through in the war. Yeah. You know, yeah. and a lot of people had PTSD, mm -hmm. and basically they took it out on, they kept it within the family, took yeah. it out in the family. I brought enough of the, I brought that picture, that's my grandad, the son. Ooh. He was, he was the, the first one in the end. House. Right, and he was one of the occupants. Uh, he, he was the first one to get that house in the end. Okay, um, this is another old photograph which shows this block of houses taken from roundabout uh, number 33, 31. So again, fantastic old photograph which shows what the area looked like um, before all the development and as you can see this is highly developed now <laughs> but it also shows the houses before any extensions were built now a lot of the extensions here are very sympathetic like number 22 you would hardly know that it's an extension same with um, the one at the corner at number 14 that's been extended to um, almost half the size again um, but sometimes it's just things like the window shapes have been changed or the number of windows. So you can see the end house here, number 20. It still has the original one window at the top, one window at the bottom. But the next house along, they've put in a couple of extra windows. So again, if you want to pass that round to have a closer look at it. Um, the next man I'm going to talk about is John Alcorn, who lived in this house, which again has been extended to possibly make it one and a half si times its original size. And newspaper photograph of John Alcorn and a photograph of his headstone. So again, if you want to pass that around. Uh, so John Alcorn was the original occupant and he was born on 22nd January 1896 to Augustus Alcorn and Isabella Stewart who farmed land at Claggan in County Donegal. John enlisted with the Royal Enniskilling Fusiliers and was posted to 9th Battalion on the Western Front sometime after 1915. 
He was admitted to 76th Field Ambulance with gunshot wounds to the head on 6th December 1917. So that would have been during um, the Cambrai operations, which is probably where they got the name for the, the houses, the lower houses at White Abbey. Um, <clears throat> He was then evacuated to hospital on number eight ambulance train the following day. So that gives you an indication of how serious his wounds were. Lance Corporal Alcorn was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal. And for those of you who don't know, the Distinguished Conduct Medal was just issued to um, non, uh, other ranks and non-commissioned officers. No officers were ever um, awarded that medal. And it was one step down from a Victoria Cross. And the, the uh, citation was reported in the London Gazette in March 1918. For conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty, when his company was held up during an advance by machine gun fire from a strong point, he led a party in an attack on the position over ground swept by a machine gun fire. He showed the greatest courage and determination and captured the position together with two machine guns and some um, prisoners. Doesn't say how many prisoners. Transferred to the Class Z Army Reserve on 30th March 1919 and was living at 182 Blythe Street over in Sandy Road District when he was awarded a 20% disability pension in respect of gunshot wounds to the forehead at the rate of eight shillings per week. The pension card records that he lived at Glen Collier Street and Sparman Street, which are both in sort of North Belfast direction. John Alcon was a motor mechanic when he married Marcella Commons, a parlour maid, on 4th January 1924 at St Anne's Church of Ireland Cathedral. He was recorded as the occupant in the 1926 Belfast Street Directory, but the Alcorn family was evicted by the ISSLT in 1934 for non-payment of the rent. At that stage, in the Irish Free State, the tenants of ISSLT properties had taken the trust to court, arguing that they had no legal right to charge rents. And when you look at the legislation, doesn't say anywhere in it that they had a right to charge rents. But the trust argued that it was self-evident that rents were required to enable the properties to be maintained. But it went to the Supreme Court in Dublin and the Supreme Court determined, no, they did not have the right to charge rents. So in the, in the Irish Free State, the uh, ex-servicemen, ex the veterans, got to live in ISSLT properties rent-free from the 1930s onwards. 1939, um, some of the houses were beginning to show their, the, the effects of time and weather. So the tenants asked the ISSLT to renovate them. And the ISSLT said, no, because we don't have the money, because you didn't pay the rents. <laughs> so basically, it was a classic case of shooting yourself in the foot so they then took the, the trust to court saying, these houses have been allocated to us and they're not maintaining them. And the courts decided, well, you didn't want to pay the rents towards the maintenance of the properties. So you can't now expect them to maintain the properties on your behalf. So as I said, classic case of shooting yourself in the foot. But once the decision by the Supreme Court in Dublin became known in, in Northern Ireland, the local um, tenants decided, well, if they're getting that, we should get that. They took the trust to court and they lost. Same act, exactly the same wording. Two Supreme Courts, one in Belfast, one in Dublin. One decides no rents can be charged. The others decided yes, rents were implicit in the wording of the act. So anyway, um, in the 1930s, uh, local residents went on a rent strike whilst the case was ongoing. And unfortunately, um, the Alcorn family were evicted under that process. Rightly or wrongly, it's not for me to say, but in my opinion, it was wrong. <clears throat> the Alcorns were living at Glasgow Street when his son, Reggie Desmond Alcorn, died at the Matter Hospital on 6th July 1934 at the age of four years after falling from an upstairs window in the family home two days earlier. The Alcorns were living at Northwood Road when Marcella died at the Royal Victoria Hospital on 5th March 1946, aged 45, and John died at Northwood Road on 12th March 1982, aged 86. John, Marcella and Reggie Alcorn are buried in Carnmoney Cemetery. The, um, the headstone is on the photograph, which I think is 
doing the cedar roots is doing the rounds. That's behind that. Oh, that's right. Um, on the cemetery records, Reggie's name is recorded as. Is it on there as well? Um, they're just recorded as Reggie on the headstone, but in the records, it's recorded as Ragnald. So I don't know whether there's just been a typographical error when the records were being digitized or whether they had no, um, Norwegian blood or something. So anyway, that's um, this house here. The next one we're going to look at is number 33, which is the one with the mock Tudor. Look. When was, was that road built? Did this road here. These were all built exactly at the same time. Well, that between 1924 and 1925. Sorry, 1923 and 19. What did I say at the start? I thought these were built first and then those ones were built. It's possible that those were built first, but they were all built in the same period. They were all occupied by 1926. Okay, um, this is another historic photograph which was taken from roughly where you're all standing, looking down that way. And you can see in it the gate posts to Ferna House. So that's 33 and 30, so yeah, 35 and 33. And you've got 31, and then you've got a wee bit of 29 showing in that photograph. Um, but the, that was all, the gates were roughly where that white car is. That must have been just, just there. Yeah, at the bottom of the lane. There was one of those posts found down there. Yeah, there was. Other. Yep. And apparently it's um, the, the, the builder that found it now has it on his property up High Town Road somewhere. But anyway, um, so... When did those gates come down? Don't know. I would say that whenever these houses were being built... Sorry? Well, I'm standing here. Ah, nothing's coming. Okay, can you come a bit closer, folks, so that I don't have to shout too much? Number 33, Ypres Park, um, has been extended, obviously, to about, I don't know, twice its original size. The first occupant there was John O'Neill, who was a civil servant. And civil servant is a very strange misno mis um, misnomer, thank you very much. Are you a civil servant? I am. A yeah, right, there you go. <laughs> um, because it could cover a wide range of occupations. A lot of people in the 1920s, um, the new government in Northern Ireland and Belfast Corporation and other corporations had a policy of giving, giving preference to veterans of the war. Um, thank you. And in doing that, one of the ways in which they gave preference was, especially when the, the new ministries were formed in the early 1920s, they needed men to transfer documents between offices and to transfer documents between one building and another building. And so you get government messengers. And I remember when I worked in the civil service in the 1980s, you would still see guys and they had their medal ribbons on. Okay, so um, they wore their medal ribbons at, at work. They were messengers. Later, they would have been involved in security at going into and out of government buildings like parliament buildings and castle buildings and so forth. But often in the street directories, they would record their occupation as civil servant, quite rightly because they were employed in the civil service as messengers. Um, in others, they described their occupation as messenger, which makes you think of somebody that delivers messages for a local butcher or um, for a newspaper. So it can be a bit of a misnomerous term um, but anyway, here was the occupation occupant in 1926. In 1927, the occupant was F. Cummings. And a lot of these houses changed hands for a variety of reasons. Maybe people um, were just moving away from Northern Ireland altogether, or maybe this guy was transferred from Belfast to Londonderry or to Carrickfergus or wherever, and he needed to move house as well. But anyway, Frederick William Cummings was born in 1885 at Camberwell in London to William Naseby Cummings, who may or may not have been named after the battle, civil, English Civil War battle, but it's a bit of a strange forename, Naseby, spelt with a Z. 
And he was a provision merchant, and his wife was Marie Siddell. Frederick was working as a chauffeur when he enlisted with the, first, with the Leicestershire Regiment on 31st August 1908, and was serving with 1st Battalion when he married Agnes Martha Dark, a widowed barmaid, on 3rd May 1910 at Holy Trinity Church in Aldershot. Transferred to the Army Service Corps in 1911 and was deployed to France on 14th August 1914. Served on the Western Front until July 1915 and then at Gallipoli where he was attached to the um, South Scottish Horse Field Ambulance. Uh, but I'm bummed, where was I? Lost my place now. Yep, yep. He was stationed um, after Gallipoli, he served with the Egyptian Expeditionary Force until May 1919. So he was still in the army six months after the cease, after the armistice. Um, he was stationed with 1154 Mechanical Transport Company in Belfast from September 1919 to February 1920. And he also served on detached duty in Enniskillen in August 1920. Discharged the termination of his period of engagement, having served for 12 years. Frederick William Cummings was a motor mechanic and living at Lincoln Avenue when he married Maud Markey from Annette Street on 21st January 1921 at St. Malachy's Roman Catholic Church in Alfred Street. Ironically, the ground for the, where that church was built was donated to the Catholic Church by a group of Presbyterians. Bizarre. Anyway, um, Frederick Cummings died on 11th February 1950, age 64, and Maud Cummings died at 33 Ypres Park on 10th May 1960, age 62. Frederick and Maud Cummings are buried in Our Lady's, Ladies Acre Cemetery in White House, but I could not find a headstone um, with their details on it. Now, he was married in 1908 to Agnes Martha Dark, I cannot find any record of Agnes Martha um, Cummings dying. I can also not find any record of them divorcing. So it's possible he was a bigamist. Possibly not. We don't know. But I have come across others when I've been doing research where um, a man who was given one of the ISSLT properties and he, was, he had married three times. Um, but only one of his wives had died by the time he married his third, third wife. <laughs> and um, his wife said that she was the legal widow or the legal wife of the man. And he said, no, you're not. Because the second marriage, the first marriage was legit. The second was bigamous. She had then died. But the third was still bigamous from the first marriage. Ugh, it's crazy. But anyway, that's the Cummings of number 33. The next one is number 27, which is that cream. Yay! The locals. Oops. Am I just about get done? <laughs> okay, if you just want to stop, stop there. This is her daddy I'm talking about. We have been friends for years. She wouldn't let us out to go to the bonfires. Quite right, too. Okay, number 27. Um, the street directory records the occupant as PJ Brennan in 1926 and as F Penny in 1927. Mr. Penny was recorded as the occupant at number 26 in 1928. So basically he'd moved from 27 over to almost directly opposite that house um, over um, just beyond the trees there. 36, 32. No, sorry, it's the end one, the cream end one on this block of four. Um, again, why they moved, maybe it was to get a bigger garden. Who knows? Um, T. James McCafferty was listed as as the occupant from 1928 to at least 1935, and a later occupant was Stephen Hobbs. Yay! <laughs> Let's hear it for the rowdies. <laughs> right, whenever I finish, you can give a homily. Right. No <laughs> a humble homily. Um, okay, Stephen Hobbs was born on 25th July 1885, and this is he. 
photograph provided by Maima, mm -hmm. um, Royal Irish Rifles uniform, and that's a photograph of the headstone in Carn Money. Mm -hmm. It does. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah, but you need to um, bleach in water is better. Um, but you, but you need to you need to scrub it in. Um, believe me, I've done some of those. And there's also um, a specialised stone cleaner which you can get in the likes of B and Q, which is very good. Andy's do a nice one for a white stone. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Andy stores Monkstown do a headstone oh, right. for a white, yeah. white marble. Or Okay, can we get back to talking about the manner we're going to talk about gravestones? <laughs> Very liquid, yeah, with a lot of elbow grease. I've done that as well. Okay, um, where was I? Yeah, he was born at Fintona in County Tyrone to Stephen Hobbs, who is a tailor, and Letitia Atwell. His father died at Tyrone County Infirmary on 10th March 1887, aged 39. And Letitia and three sons were living at Boyne Square in Belfast in 1901. Boyne Square is over um, tail end of Sandy Row. Letitia Hobbs died at Teutonic Street on 4th November 1908, aged 52. In 1911, Stephen was working as a flax ruffer and was living at Teutonic Street with an elder brother, Robert James. Stephen was living at Durham Street when he married Margaret Elizabeth Pike from Stanley Street on 30th May 1911 at St Anne's Parish Church. In the entry in the Register of Marriages, um, it records his name as Stephen Edward Hobbs. He enlisted with the um, Royal Irish Rifles. Um, where am I? Yeah. Yep, he enlisted with the Royal Irish Rifles on 11 September 1914, but was not posted overseas until 19, after 1915. Served with the 9th Battalion before being transferred to the Labour Corps and was serving with 894th Garrison Guards Company when he was admitted to the number 39 General Hospital with bronchitis at the end of February 1918. So remember 1918 we had the massive global um, flu pandemic which I believe started in China. <laughs> oh sorry yeah yeah um, he was evacuated to England on HM hospital ship Carisbrook Castle on 7th March 1918. He then served with the 367 Home Service Labour Company and he was discharged due to sickness on 11th January 1919, age 31, with what was called the Silver War Badge. And that was a badge that was allocated to men discharged due to wounds or illness so they would not be mistaken for shirkers or cowards. He was living at Eureka Street when he was awarded a 30% disability pension in respect of bronchitis and a heart condition at the rate of 12 shillings per week, plus an allowance of three shillings per week for his wife. Stephen Hobbs died on 25th May 1948, aged 62, and Margaret Elizabeth Hobbs was living at 27 Ypres Park when she died at hospital on 19 September 1969, aged 79. Stephen and Margaret Hobbs are buried in Carnmoney East Cemetery. Also buried in the plot is their daughter, Margaret, who died in 1971. The Hobbs family was still living at 27 Ypres Park when Jemima Carlton Hobbs married Ian Robert Parker and Elaine Hobbs married William McClanahan. <laughs> hey, have I got that right? Good enough. So do you want to add anything, Mima? Granny always told the story that my granddad was shipped down to the uprising. Yes. And we don't know much, he never thought he asked questions, but I can only assume that he was maybe in a hospital and they took who could stand. Yeah. And because he came over on a boat, so he must have come over with an English regiment. Right. And was shipped down where he was shell shocked. Now that's the story Granny told. I don't know. We don't have um, anything to back it up. Yeah. A lot of the soldiers had to go down. Yes, a lot of men who were um, stationed in England or indeed in, in Ulster mm. went, especially in reserve battalions, yeah. were sent down to Dublin. So um, a lot of people with the 5th Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers, for example, mm. um, I know of one um, officer from that battalion who died in a shooting accident. He was accidentally shot by one of the, um, the guards at a military outpost by accident. They, he mistook him for a an insurgent. Um, 
So it's quite possible. It's possible that he was stationed in Belfast from St. Anne. It's possible that he had been, was stationed in England waiting to be sent to be deployed to France and was moved to Ireland or back to Dublin instead. Unfortunately, because so many of the service records do not survive, there's no documentary evidence of those. There's plenty of documentary evidence for the men who died during the Easter Rising, the members of the army um, who died during the Easter Rising. And there's others who are buried in, in, in Northern Ireland who died in that Rising. Um, but without, I'm, I'm very much a stickler for accuracy. Peter says, don't worry about the details, you know. But I like to keep to what I can definitively say. Because if I put down that he was in such and such and was at Dublin, somebody would say, well, how do you know that? Give me the proof, give me the evidence. And if I don't have the evidence, I'm not going to say it. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean he didn't. Um, I'm, I'm just doing, I'm, the information I provide is what I can stand over. Yeah, you don't. Right, okay, the next one, which is the, we're getting close to the end, is number 19. I tried to trace my grandma's records, and a lot of the records were sent apparently to Kew Gardens and Mountain. Yeah. They were bombed by uh, the, the Nazis in the yeah, Second World yeah, War. Yeah, but that's, yep. So There's a lot of the records are missing now? About 80%, they reckon, uh -huh. of Great War service. Yeah. It's not even centred. The door's not even centred in the garage. See that? Uh, I'm just tr trying to keep a track on what house number we're stopping at. Yeah, so it's, it makes it very difficult. It's number 19, which I think is this um, sort of off cream coloured one. Yeah, number 19. So you can see that end house has been doubled in size. Yeah, yeah. Um, it can be very difficult. I do have some. Yeah. Hang on, ladies. Hang on, ladies. Karen. Right, Farron. Backtrack, put her in reverse. You're not here to enjoy yourselves. <laughs> you don't want to see a woman reverse, huh? you? Want to see a woman reverse? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm saying nothing. For a change. For a change. Um, so I, I think I do have a biography on on um, Thomas Dickey. Tumulty, Tum yeah. Tumulty. Yeah. Um, so if you give me your email address, right. I can send you what you've what I've already got. Yeah. And in return, you can send me a copy of that photograph. I can send you this, George papers and all that sort of oh, stuff. Oh, well. great. I, it's, I've probably got some of them, yeah. but I would have quite, maybe have his pension stuff yeah. as well, which maybe you don't have, yeah, no, don't which know. would tell you how much, yeah. um, how much pension he got yeah. um, and what he got the pension for, yeah. and which can be fantastic because it gives addresses. It'll tell you whether the man was single. Although sometimes if it doesn't say that he was married, yeah, it doesn't mean he wasn't married. It just means that yeah. it wasn't declared. He had seven kids and one died, so in that house. So. Uh, kids. Um, but it's, it's amazing what, you, what the amount of information that's now, compared to even 10 years ago, yeah. there's so much more information available. Okay, Jim McFadden. Never heard of him. Okay, number, number 19, Ypres Park. Uh, the people that lived here were the Dumigans, Dumigan, pronounce it how you will. John Dummigan was born on 15th April 1895 at Lake Street to James Colvin Dummigan, who was a carter and a dock labourer, and his mother was Elizabeth Nesbitt. By the way, before Peter says, rather than saying so-and-so and Mary, nay, nay, I just used the mother's maiden name. So it doesn't mean they were all unmarried, illegitimate births. It just means that I'm being lazy. In the 1911 census, the family was living at Lake Street and John was working as an apprentice horse, horse shoer. Which reminds me of a joke, but I won't tell you it. Um, he enlisted. <laughs> I will tell it to you. This this guy applies for a job as a, in a blacksmith, and the guy says, "Have you ever shoed a horse?" And he says, "No, but I did once tell a donkey to clear off." <laughs> I called my dog blacksmith because every time I said walk, he just made a bolt for the door. <laughs> <laughs> Why did he get more laughs than I did? Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about this. We're just going off into a comedy, comedy circle. Okay, um, he enlisted with the North Irish horse because obviously he was used to working with horses and um, as, a, as a blacksmith. And obviously North Irish horse, although they spent most of the time galloping around in the saddle, they also had to look after their mounts. 
They enlisted in October 1914 and was deployed to France with D Squadron, which was the cavalry uh, unit for the 51st Division on 1st May 1915. He later served in the Corps of Hussars before being transferred to the Corps of Dragoons, being posted to the 2nd Dragoons, which were the Royal Scots Greys. And at that stage, he held the rank of Shoeing Smith, Shoeing Smith Corporal. John Dummigan was transferred to the Class Z Army Reserve on 30th um, April 1919 and is commemorated on the memorial tablet for Crescent Presbyterian Church on the University Road. Um, that tablet is now um, in the premises of Fitzroy Presbyterian Church, with which it amalgamated in the 1970s. Um, he was working as a blacksmith and living at Lavinia Street when he married Martha Beatty on 25th September 1919 at Rugby Avenue Congregational Church. Rugby Avenue Congregational Church is now a way out near Carry Duff, but it's still called Rugby Avenue Congregational Church. Their first son, John D um, Beatty Dummigan, and this is he, if you want to pass that round, was serving with the Royal Navy as a convoy signalman on SS Fort Bellingham when he lost his life on active service. On 26th January 1944, convoy JW-56A, take a note of that, I'll be asking questions at the end, um, was attacked by the German submarine U-360 in the Barents Sea. SS Fort Bellingham was hit and fell behind the remainder of the convoy. She was then torpedoed and sunk by German submarine U-957 with the loss of 37 lives. John Beatty Dummigan is commemorated on the Chatham Naval Memorial and on the Roll of Honour in White Abbey Royal British Legion Hall and on the memorial plaque for White Abbey Congregational Church, which is now closed. And I think the tablet is still inside the church building. Um, so I'm not quite sure what will happen to it in the long run. Um, John Dummigan was recorded as the occupant in the 1935 Belf Belfast Street Directory and a Mrs. Boyce was living at 19 April Park in 1940. Henry Foster was living at the address when he died at Belfast City Hospital on 11th June 1954, age 65. And Jane Foster died on 8th July 1963, age 79. Henry and Jane Foster are buried in Carnmoney East Cemetery. Because the Dummigans moved out of the house quite early on, I don't know where they lived when they died, so I haven't been able to identify where they're buried. Okay, two more to go. Next one is number 11. Uh, yeah, but it's not a, it's not a common, it's not a Yeah, I, whenever I was researching, I was, I was quite surprised to find that he was Presbyterian because it's just, it's a name that, rightly or wrongly, I would associate with, with Roman Catholics, but there you go. <laughs> Maybe I'm just a sectarian. <sighs> Number 11. So it'll be the, again, one of the, that sort of um, pebble dashed one, which I think is being renovated. Okay, if you want to just stop here, well, move on a wee bit more. When I stop here, I was expecting you to walk on another 10 meters. <laughs> stop here. <laughs> I think this house is being renovated. You can see it's got new doors and windows in. And whenever I was going around putting leaflets through the doors, I could hear banging coming from inside. Thank you. Yeah. The guy in that house, he built a book in that garden. Yes, so I was, Somebody was saying that earlier. Did he uh, it was a massive Did he take it did it ever actually go to sea? Yeah, yeah. Did it hit an iceberg? No. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how many people work in the shipyard? Half of them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> boom boom. Okay, number eleven. I was giving a talk once um and I I mentioned um Belfast shipyard and I said not the one where the ship sank whose ship sank and this guy gave me a really dirty look says I worked in Harlan Wolves I thought okay <laughs> anyway 1926 the occupant of this house was AC Johnston and he was a joiner 
And Jay Martin, also a joiner, was the occupant from 1927 to 29. The third occupant was called Jay Officer. And in 1950, the winning family was recorded as being the occupants. And again, newspaper photograph and headstone. William Hill winning. William Hill winning. Jeebus. If he went to the bet, he, he, <laughs> he went to the betting shop, went to Hills, but no winnings. Born on 25th September 1895 at Brashenhe to James Winning and Margaret Clark. The family moved to Belfast and lived at Paris Street in 1901 and at James Street in 1911 when William was a catch boy in a mill. I'm not sure what a catch boy in a mill did. I know what a catch boy in the shipyard did, and that was to catch rivets. So in the riveting team at Hardin Wolf, you would have had the heater boy and he heated the rivets and he would then wail them up in the air. The catch boy would catch the rivets and then the riveter would bang them in. And there was also a holder upper who held up the item that was to be bol um, bolted in. <sighs> holder upper in the shipyard. <laughs> Nowadays a holder upper is somebody that goes into the bank with a mask over. <clears throat> Family Luth, um, he enlisted with the Royal Enniskilling Fusiliers and was posted the 10th Battalion on the Western Front after 1915. He later served with 2nd Battalion and was reported as wounded in the War Office daily lists dated 21st September 1917 and 7th December 1918. Lance Corporal Winning was transferred to the Class Z Army Reserve on 20th February 1919 and was living at James Street when he was awarded a 15% disability pension in respect of gunshot wounds to the left hand at the rate of eight shillings per week. In 1921, he received a lump sum of 52 pounds and 10 shillings as full and final settlement of his um, pension. And that would be just over 2,100 pounds today. You'd get more if you had whiplash. William married Mary Agnes Walker on 19 September 1920 at St. Luke's Church of Ireland on Northumberland Street in between Shankland Falls. And two of their sons were members of the White Abbey platoon of the Army Cadet Force in 1950. William Winning was living at 11 Ypres Park when he died on 27th October 1965, aged 70. And Mary Agnes Winning was living at Derry Cool Way when she died at hospital on 3rd June 1983. William and Mary Winning are buried in Carnmoney East Cemetery and the headstones in that photograph. And again, it could do with a bit of a scrub. Okay, the last stop is in the, um, the, the end house of the last block. Is that the end single house then? Yeah, that's, that's been built, that's an infill. Oh, is it? That's yeah. been built in the garden of number seven. Oh. And there's a there's another one, if you look up between, yeah. There's a the, there's a house. Maybe it's at the back at the beside. No, it's the beside. See, you can just see it up in the hill there. Well, that's built in the garden. Or no, sorry, it's that one. You can just see the dormer window. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah, behind the palm tree. Okay. If you just want to stop here. Yep. Number seven. We have a, Yeah, that's a seven. Okay, this is our last stop, you'll be glad to hear. Or maybe not. Sorry? <laughs> is that a loose post over there? Okay, the last... Huh? Depends if Johnny Evans was playing or not. Ah oh dear. Mind you, Norwich City, I mean. Um, so number seven, you can see that a, a modern house has been built in the garden of number seven, um, which, and also if you look just behind that new build garage there, there's another house which has been built in the gardens of number two. So obviously um, these, ha these houses, the gardens were so, lord, so large that you could sell them off and build properties in them, um, which, yeah, well, it happens. So this is the last guy I'm gonna talk about, and he was the occupant of this house here. Number 20, between 1926 and 1928, the occupant was William Boyd. 
but the property was recorded as vacant in 1929. Joseph Lowry, a compositor, in other words, a printer, was recorded as the occupant in 1930 and 1931. The 1932 rent revaluation records R.D. Keenan as the property and a William Ray was living at 7 Ypres Park when he died on 27th July 1943, aged 54. And his widow Martha was living at 7 Ypres Park when her son-in-law David Nutt died in 1951. But I'm picking out Robert Keenan because he was the guy I could find most of and he's the guy I had a photograph of and to me that justifies my selection. You may disagree, but tough, it's my tour. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Keenan was born 1st December 1888 at Tyony Townland near Claddy in County Londonderry to James Keenan, who was a farmer, and Margaret Dool. In some documentation, his uh, second forename is recorded D-O-O-L, sometimes as D-O-O-L-E, and sometimes as Doyle, and also sometimes as Dale. So I'm going by the fact that in, when his mother married, her maiden name was recorded as Dool, D-O-O-L, and that's what I'm sticking with in my records. Uh, James, Robert enlisted with the Royal Irish Fusiliers on 12th August 1907 and was stationed at St. Santa Lucia Barracks in Borden in England with 1st Battalion in 1911. Deployed to France with 1st Battalion on 22nd August 1914, so two, two and a half weeks after the war started. He was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal for his action at St. Julian in April 1915, and the citation was published in the London Gazette in June 1915 for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty in going out in broad daylight and bringing to safety four wounded men under shell and rifle fire. This non-commissioned officer had, had, has previously been reported reported on for good service. The people that wrote the citations, their English was abysmal. It really was. Almost as bad as the Belfast Telegraph. Or newsletter. <laughs> anyway, Sergeant Keenan was discharged due to wounds on 8th October 1915. So basically his war lasted just about a year and he received the Silver War badge and he was awarded a pension in respect of deafness. What? Um, he was a vulcanizer. Anyone know what a vulcanizer was? Where did the sulfur add and the sulfur to rubber to make it malleable? There's always one clever sod, isn't there? Sorry, you did add. I did. Um, a vulcanizer. You've heard of vulcanized rubber? That's it. So, a prize to the man with the um, blue woolly hat. Um, Working in Cumbria when he married Margaret Mullen on 1st January 1917 at St. Jude's Church of Ireland, Muckamore, and is commemorated on the memorial tablet in the church. Robert was a munitions worker when two sons, Robert Dool Keenan and John Keenan, were born at Shinogues Town near Muckamore in December 1917 and December 1918. So although he had served in France on the front line, he then carried out more war service after he was discharged working in a munitions factory. Um, after leaving Ypres Park, the Keenans emigrated to Canada and lived at Kansas Avenue in Belfast when they returned in October 1954. Robert Keenan was living in, at one of the houses, the ISSLT houses at Jellicoe Avenue um, in the Skegganeel area when he died on 7th October 1971, aged 83. It's not clear whether he was living with um, a relative, a daughter or a son, who had married the daughter or son of the ex, the veteran who lived in that Jellicoe Avenue house. So quite often the ex-servicemen community um, intermarried. Um, so that would be my gut feeling is that he died at either his son-in-law's house or his daughter-in-law's house. Uh, Isabella Keenan died at Oldfield's, Oldfield House on the Antrim Road on 6th April 1983, aged 89. And Robert and Isabella are buried in Roselawn Cemetery, and that's their headstone in that cemetery. A lot of ex-servicemen who lived in the ISSLT houses are buried in um, Roselawn Cemetery. 
make a great tour if anyone did graveyard tours, but I don't know of anyone that does. <laughs> Watch out, Peter, you're going to get knocked down. Have another go, love. <laughs> okay, folks, and that brings the tour to an end. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something. Um, and if anyone wants to get copies of the plans for the houses, give me your email address and I'll send them on. I think I've sent all these to you, have I? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I know I've sent them to the Brennans. Yeah. Um, but if anyone else does want them, if you can jot down your email address on one of these wet scraps of paper, I'll get that organized for you. And for you, I'll um, send you what I've currently got on the occupant of 35. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Nigel, where would I get an excellent walking tour uh, with a World War II theme in the Carrick Fergus area? Um, I think you'd find it um, in Carrick Fergus. Yes. <laughs> oh, right, yes. Um, yes, Carrick Fergus. I think I would recommend um, uh, Andy. I, I would, no, I would recommend Andy Glenfield. He does excellent tours. Hello, this is. I knew I recognised your face from somewhere, but I couldn't. This is Adrian Hack, who's a Carrick Fergus historian, primarily with the Second World War, and um, I'm one of my stalkers, one of my many stalkers. Talking of the Second World War, I will be doing two Blitz-related graveyard tours, one in April and one in May. The one in April is going to be based in Carnmoney Cemetery. So again, I'll. I'll have that put up on the um, the White Abbey Bleach Works webs or Facebook page, but it'll look at a variety of people who are buried mainly in Carnmoney East Cemetery, but also some that are buried in the Wee Corner Cemetery, um, which is technically or was a church graveyard. It's now managed by the, the council. So I'll be doing that, and again, probably visit about 20 graves of Blitz fatalities, including one where they have the date of death wrong for five, four or five people, which I can explain. Okay, um, if there's nothing else, folks, if anyone I wants to... Like a snippet of information about yep. 18, about the garden, actually. Um, you got a pen? So my aunt had that house, and well, in the year 2004, roughly, she said to me something about her garden, and she said, I don't own the garden. I don't own the garden. But her mum, so my grandmother, had actually bought the house way back in 1970, but had never bought the garden. It was still the... the Milliburn soldier, Trust? Uh, the land, the soldiers and sailors land. Well, trust. by that stage, it would, have been, it would have been transferred to the Milliburn Trust, who took over the Northern Ireland okay. management. Yeah. So it was still owned by them. So we only bought that garden in 2005-ish or something like that, whereas actually back then... They had bought the house way back in 1970. Yeah, it was one of the weird situations. You could buy the house on its own, or you could buy the garden. And in some cases, they sold the house to the tenant, but sold they were if the tenant didn't want to buy the, the garden, they could then sell the garden to somebody else, which is crazy, especially a garden behind one of the mid-terrace houses, yeah. because, OK, there's an access path at the back of the houses, but even so... Um, so I suppose somebody could have bought that land and yeah, built yeah. <laughs> built houses on it, but um, it's what people could afford at that time. Yeah. And if they couldn't afford to buy the house and the garden, so whenever you paid for the garden, you were paying for it current at the current prices in 2000 and whatever, yeah. as opposed to 1975 prices, which were would have been a heck of a lot less. I remember that. <laughs> well, I think whenever these houses came up for sale, started to come up for sale in the 1950s, I've, I've seen adverts for the houses in Ballymena, which were semi-detached houses, and they were being sold for £500, um, which, given that it's a three-bedroom uh, uh, three semi-detached house, was very reasonable. And again, it's because they were not doing it to make money. They were selling the houses in order to build up a fund that they could use either to build additional houses or to pay for maintenance. So for example, down in Cambria Park, um, there's a, uh, uh, a sheltered housing unit, which was built by the Milliburn Trust in the 1970s, I think around about 73, 74, um, which meant that they could, rather than having, and it was built in the gardens of some of the houses, 
and it meant that they could house something like 16 veterans as opposed to two veterans. Um, there was also a similar uh, scheme in the large colony in Craiga where they built um, a small uh, uh, sheltered housing block. So they were selling houses to order to pay for doing other work. Any other questions? What you were saying about the ground, I do remember that. Yeah. And it always had to be that passage round the back always had to be kept free. Yeah, that's right. Because that was for that was services right and bin men and things. Yeah. Yeah. And actually emptied the bins, actually collected them. And but I do remember that being, uh, you know, had been active all the time. Yeah. yeah, I remember when it was open, but it's closed now. Yeah, well, they still have to have access to the animal, the right. library, and they have a book free from vegetables. Okay. Yeah, it depends on. on I mean, I, I often wonder did, did people have to bring their bins through the houses, but obviously there were access routes. Right, folks, uh, the weather's turning again. So um, if you want to head on home, thank you very much for coming along.